Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee on Thursday, April 15, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and review those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's equity committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Armstrong, please call the roll call to determine the presence of a quorum of the Ms. Scott. Present. Dr. Hager. Present. Ms. Pasteur. Present. Ms. Mack. Present. Thank you very much. Ms. Armstrong, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Logan Washington. Present. Dr. Boswell McComas. Present. Okay, are there any other members, um, board members rather, participating on the call that um, I've not, that have not been named? Okay, Ian, are there any other staff members participating that have not been named? Hi, good Everybody. afternoon. This is Dr. Wheatley Phillip, and I am here along with members of our DRA team as well. Okay, um, you, I, I'm sorry, could you repeat that the DRA team? I didn't. Yes, um, we have Dr. Eric Minus, our Executive Director for Research and Data Analytics. We also have Dr. Asha Degans, who is our Director of Data Analytics, and Dr. Maria Finger Elam, who is our Coordinator for um, Strategic. Ooh. I forgot her title. She's not one of our coordinators, but she's the author of the report today. Oh, wonderful. Okay. She's a coordinator of data strategy. My apologies. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us. Okay. And Heather Lagerman from Organizational Effectiveness. I work with Candace. Dr. Logan oh, Washington. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mike Bernard Adams is also here. Dr. Adams, good to see you, Ms. Scott. Welcome, Dr. Adams. Good afternoon. This is Mike Zarchin, Chief of School Climate and Safety, and I am joined by Dr. Amalio Nieves. Thank you. Everyone accounted for? Okay. All right, so our first item of discussion um, will be the social emotional learning reopening presentation and support to our teachers. So we will have a discussion on social emotional learning and a presentation to support our teachers from Dr. Zarshin and Dr. Nieves. I hope I pronounced that right. Thank you. So if you're ready, Thank please you. go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. We are pleased to be here this afternoon. Uh, I'll provide just a general overview and then uh, turn it to Dr. Nieves to share uh, more information that will be available for questions as we go through. Um, we are probably, to, to my thinking, going through one of the most challenging times in American education. Um, with a twin pandemic, um, all the challenges that we have had uh, beyond the, the pandemic, COVID-19, ongoing issues with social justice that we continually see in the news and unfortunately locally, uh, we are really focused on setting up a, a, a climate, a culture, an atmosphere where we have safety in place, predictability, and relationship. And when I talk about 
the safety, it's, it's not just physical, but emotional safety. So when our students, employees come to school, come to work every day, they feel safe uh, to, to share, they feel welcomed, and they feel like some they're known for who they are, what they bring every day, uh, their gifts, their challenges, and it, everything that goes along with their, their backgrounds, that it's celebrated and understood. So that is a, a, a lofty goal. Uh, when you think about the number of staff and students in BCPS, but it's one that we believe we can achieve through relationships and a high caring atmosphere uh, where we have warm demanders. We, we know the students, we know our employees, and we push them to be their best because we care for them. Uh, this school year, we have students coming back who have experienced profound trauma, and we have students and staff returning uh, on both ends of the, the spectrum. Ones that may not really be able to speak of much other than an interruption of school, uh, which is probably very few, but we've got that type of range we're trying to address. And we do that through a multi-tiered approach to providing supports uh, and, and, and building on our staff and student excellence. Uh, with that, what I'd like to do is turn it to Dr. Nieves who can talk about you know, the range of supports that for our students may be home visits um, all the way down to classroom instruction and then how we're working with staff to build their knowledge so we, we can support the students and one another to the best extent possible. Dr. Nieves. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. Good afternoon, members of the Board of Education and my fellow colleagues. Um, I'm excited to be here uh, before all of you this afternoon and to uh, to share the work. Um, as, as we go, it's, uh, the slides that you'll see um, are a result of training that was provided to school-based teams, to our educators as part of our reopening um, support. Uh, and professional learning that was provided. So you'll see the entire training, but as I go through the slides, I'll just be focusing on some of the key points and on some of the key slides, and I'll elaborate on that so that you get an idea of the training and supports that uh, we have been offering our staff as they continue with their reopening. Next slide, please. Next slide. And then the next slide. So as Dr. Zarchin uh, alluded to, the reopening has prompted us to get curious and think creatively about how we welcome not just our students, but our adults back. And as Dr. Zarchin mentioned, understanding their lived experiences um, that have been impacted by COVID, uh, the social unrest, um, and in any, other, any other number of stressors in their lives. And our shared goal as a, as a team is to ensure, as he mentioned, safety, predictability, and relationships. So important to that is that we know that the human condition is two, is that, I'm sorry, is that about the human condition, two fundamental needs are the need for safety and the need for relationships. And so by experiencing safety and predictability, our students, our staff are able to calm their brains by knowing what to expect, what their resources are, and thereby, therefore allowing for authentic connections and a calming of the mind so that there then can be access to instruction. Keep in mind, as Dr. Zarchin mentioned, that each child and adult experience the stressors of life in a variety of ways. And it is critical that we welcome the whole individual and honor the lived experience, which uh, might bring a whole sense of discomfort for many of us as we try to understand the needs of our students and staff. So know that these efforts will extend beyond the first day, 
the first week, the first month, that our efforts may go on for a long period of time as we continue to welcome our students back and continue to make sure that we ensure safety, predictability, and relationships. A year of change, unknowns, new adjust, new schools, new norms and expectations, it's all gonna take time for our students and staff to get adjusted to. Next slide, please. So as we uh, worked with our teachers and, um, and our school leaders and uh, other staff, we really focused our training on defining what social emotional learning um, is, ensuring that they prioritize safe, supportive, culturally sustaining and equitable learning environments. So making sure that again, that we focused on Maslow before Bloom and then identifying what, what are strategies to promote healing and build community in, in, in the hybrid learning environment. So again, as we get used to that, how do we uh, reestablish or in some cases establish relationships for the first time um, that then sets that foundation for promoting healing um, and, and to build the community that we'd like to see. And then part of the work with our school leaders uh, and, and staff was also so that they could learn about the supports and interventions that, were that are available to them, not just through the Division of School Climate and Safety, but in collaboration with our partners in the other divisions and offices to ensure social emotional well-being, not just for our students, but our staff, and tending also to the mental health and well-being of all Team BCPS members. Next slide. So key to uh, this whole piece was ensuring that we all had a common language around what social emotional learning um, truly is and understanding that social emotional learning is not a thing, it's not a program, but rather a process and that this process is not just for children, but also for adults, for them to understand and manage their emotions, set and achieve goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish relationships and make decisions. And one key piece as I, as I was talking with Dr. Logan Washington earlier uh, today, and we were talking that, that just like equity is a way of being, social emotional learning is a way of being. And, th and that these skills are good for all of us, not just for a group of students or a group of adults, but then these, these skills are the way of being for all of us. And so ensuring that as our, our school leaders and staff focus on the social emotional needs of students and staff, how do, we, how do we intentionally schedule time to ensure that there's time for conversation, that there's time for getting to know our students and staff beyond their name and their titles, but really understanding their uh, their lived experiences so that we can establish uh, the optimal learning conditions. Next slide, please. And so one of the resources that uh, the Division in School Climate put together as a resource for our school leaders and staff was the development of a 30-day plan. And um, actually, we developed a plan last summer as we uh, uh, prepared to uh, begin uh, classes in September. And we updated the plan as we uh, began looking at reopening schools. And what the 30-day uh, the plan does, it, it focuses on BCPS, BCPS's SEL competencies of awareness, relationships, and uh, decision-making. And so there are many strategies for staff and for students um, in the plan. And they're just-in-time strategies that our school leaders can pick to meet the needs of our, our students and staff. And um, we've, uh, we've also provided additional resources that uh, align with the 30-day plan. For example, restorative practices, um, 
resources on conscious discipline, resources on mindfulness, um, and, and many other resources uh, that the, the Department of Social Emotional Support put together for our staff. Next slide, please. So you'll see an example of, of what the, the inside of the 30 day plan um, looks like. The components, um, even though they outline the week, these strategies can be uh, ongoing and at any time of the year, um, you'll see the goals and the outcomes for the activities. And then you'll see, uh, depending on the activity, uh, what are administrator actions, staff actions, and student actions as well. So the example you see before you right now, this is as faculty and staff came back on duty. So while you'll see administrator and staff actions, you, you're not seeing any student actions, but in the latter weeks um, in the 30 day plan, you'll see some specific student actions uh, outlined. Next slide, please. So this is just uh, our SEL framework um, and just showing again how uh, we use uh, our three competencies through the lens of equity, ensuring that we are grounded in equity and, um, and that we are surrounding um, the, the whole child through our efforts uh, with families, with staff, community, to ensure that we are addressing the needs of the whole child. Next slide, please. So in the next couple of slides, what we did um, as part of our staff development was uh, to uh, professional development for, for staff was to take each of the competencies, go a little bit deeper in terms of the definition and give some practical examples of ways that uh, the staff could reinforce those skills in students, in staff um, that were grounded in um, in the in the three in the competencies, and again, just giving some practical examples that they could do any time um, that they felt that it would be appropriate for their students and staff. So things like faculty check-ins, um, using our equity uh, compass and and the various equity tools to ensure that we could have courageous conversations and understand the experiences. Um, of students and staff hold uh, circles uh, and restorative uh, conferences. And key to, again, when Dr. Zarchin was talking about establishing predictability and relationships, we wanted to make sure that um, as students were transitioning back to in-person learning, how did the expectations and uh, procedures now look and for many students uh, coming into the building, like our kindergarten students coming in for the first time, um, how, how would we teach them the expectations and procedures in the, and I'm using air quotes, the new normal. Next slide, please. So you'll see again, um, just um, other ways that we would promote decision making and uh, suggested activities. And we, what we did as part of the training was to engage staff in, um, in how they could see implementing these strategies. Um, what resource personnel could they also use? So how would they, could they leverage the use of our school social workers, our school counselors, our pupil personnel workers, our school psychologists um, in, in carrying out these activities, um, engaging students um, in activities, but as, uh, as but staff as well. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna go, but again, you'll see some more examples here, again, referring to uh, how can we help our students uh, be able to access the supports that they would need, um, ensuring that they knew how to access uh, uh, mental health professionals or to seek help um, when they needed it, to find trusted adults. And then a key to all of this is partnering with our families. And uh, one of the things that we did in collaboration 
with the uh, Division of School Support and Achievement, as well as the Education of Baltimore, uh, the Education Foundation of Baltimore County was create SEL care kits for our students and families. And so part of our engagement and outreach efforts was to provide SEL uh, kits for uh, students and staff. And that's an ongoing effort uh, with the Education uh, Foundation to ensure that again, we were engaging students, but families as well. Next slide, please. And then again, uh, here just a, more examples and key also it, uh, as part of our plan to meet the needs of students and staff was uh, collaborating with the Division of Human Resources and our Employee Wellness Program. And so we work very closely with Janice Zimmerman to ensure that we are addressing the needs of adults when they, uh, when, when they express a need. Um, as well as uh, using our community mental health partners and ensuring that our students, that all our students have access to resources and services. And uh, one key piece is uh, under the leadership of Dr. Williams and Dr. Zarchin is that we, this year we launched a mental health advisory council. And so this council has been meeting um, and, and to really look at our support service delivery model around mental health and to make some recommendations. And part of this process is identifying needs in the community, unmet, unmet needs, and then uh, finding and or developing the resources that are needed. Next slide, please. You can go on to the next slide because I think I covered that. Next slide. Um, also ensuring that as we provide, and Dr. Zarchin mentioned a continuum of supports, we want to make sure that um, at part of our work as um, in our own equity journey as a division is ensuring that we are looking at how we are providing um, supports to students and ensuring that we can provide supports to students in the least restrictive environment and that we look at that we're looking at our data and students that are being identified for special ed but looking at our student support teams and ensuring uh, that uh, that there is quality and efficacy in the work of the student support teams to provide interventions and supports to students through a tiered support model that doesn't necessarily uh, need uh, uh, um, in indicate that they need a label to get the supports and resources that they need. But also a part of our work is uh, re uh, re reassuring our school leaders and our staff of the of the the support of our behavior threat assessment teams, as well as our traumatic loss teams to support our schools, to support our students and our staff when there are serious events. So again, looking at that uh, multi-tier system of support, knowing that there are some things that we are providing for some students, there are more intensive supports for students who may have a greater level of need, but then those real intensive uh, supports for uh, and more for students who uh, need that individualized, um, um, more long-term approach or support. Next slide, please. And then again, how do we build community strategies for building community was part of that, uh, whether that be with staff, with students and with families. And, I, and I'm just pleased, uh, we just, uh, the last couple of days have had uh, an evaluation done by the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. And, um, and they were able to uh, witness a class meeting uh, today. And they said it was a powerful example of, of students coming together building community, but being able to also feel and show empathy for each other. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. 
these are just more examples of strategies for building relationships. What I would say is that when we were talking to staff, one of the things that we emphasize, we understand that we are facing a multitude of complex problems that the pandemic has presented, that the social unrest in our nation has presented and any other number of things. And we know while these are complex problems, uh, we, we constantly are seeking uh, complex solutions and that critical to this is understanding that the complex solution that we're seeking is really uh, building relationships. That's the solution and building relationships and trust is key. Um, and so we that was part of this work as we plan for reopening to ensure that our students and staff had the opportunities to foster and continue to build relationships. Next slide, please. And then just uh, we shared uh, all the resources that we had uh, available. And then after uh, the trainings, we also had sessions where uh, staff members could drop in uh, and um, ask questions or ask for additional supports. Um, in addition, our school counselors have built lessons uh, for our students and continue to reinforce uh, those lessons. And we've also been collaborating with our friends in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction to ensure that SEL um, is integrated um, in our lessons and activities. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Zarchin. Thank you, Dr. Nieves. At this point, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we greatly appreciate this time. Thank you so much. We greatly appreciate the presentation. Um, I can start off and if other board members have questions, please put in the chat so that I can make sure I call on you in order. Um, I found it interesting you said hope circles. Dr. Nieves, what are those? We have a uh, circles where uh, students uh, can um, look, literally get in a circle uh, and we probably are making modifications working in a hybrid environment, but it's an opportunity for for various uh, circles can be used for various things. A topic can be introduced um, by the facilitator and uh, then there can be conversation uh, around that. So for example, uh, if they a recent example, the George Floyd case, uh, then uh, the topic is open and uh, students and staff can um, have interactive discussions around that. Or if during the course of a lesson or during the course of a day, something happens that uh, uh, there, where there may be conflict uh, in the class or an incident happens, uh, the, the teacher can bring students together to then have conversations. I so the conversations are meant to, to have courageous conversations, to uh, open dialogue for students to share their lived experiences and truths, and, and to come to uh, gain a deeper understanding of self and others. And this, this, these soap circles are run by teachers? They're led, led by teachers. Um, I've seen them also led by students at the secondary level. So it, it oh, just depends. Cool. Okay, I didn't know if it was like done by uh, like social workers or like the nurse. Um, they also they also lead them. Our school counselors do. So I, uh, staff members across the system have been trained to lead these discussions. But key to that, uh, Ms. Scott, and that's a great question, key to that is ensuring that, that individuals who are leading have been provided the training um, and, and that in, um, in the school where it's happening or in the classroom that there is an understanding of what uh, restorative practices are. Okay, you answered my second question. And then lastly, I just wanted to know if, um, you know, a teacher or a student um, during, you know, school hours or even after hours, if they were having maybe a, a, a mental health crisis associated with COVID, maybe someone died or became ill. Do we have like a hotline set up that they could call or do we have something set up in the school where, where we could help give them support? We do. Uh, we have 
through human resources, we have employee assistance. Uh, one of the things we really didn't get into um, is our traumatic loss team. Um, when there is you know, a, a death uh, loss at school, this is a group of volunteers throughout the county who come together to support staff and, and students. And it is incredible when you talk about creating a caring environment and atmosphere, the, the work of these volunteers uh, and, and principals allow many school-based staff to provide this support uh, from their buildings to other schools. It's incredible and, and really builds on your kind of trust, a feeling of we're in this together um, and, and those relationships, you just, just really strengthen from, from those activities. Great, okay, thank you. So if something were happening, happening that that student or that, well, I, I assume an adult would know, but like that student would be directed and, and then given the support they need. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it looks like Dr. Hager has a comment. Yes, um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I I have a little bit of a bias, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say that up front. Um, I I do a lot of work with uh, school wellness, and so we use the WISC model, so the whole child, whole school, whole community model, for which a component of the WISC model is social emotional climate. There's also counseling, psychological, and social services. And so I just want to know if you could talk a little bit about how your office or your approach. I know you mentioned the words whole, whole child a few times, but um, you know there's so many other ways that we can support kids' mental health, including things like physical activity during the school day and ensuring that they have a meal, a healthy meal to eat, and you know there are other other kind of whole child ways um, again of, su of supporting kids, especially right now, is something we're thinking about a lot. So I don't know if you could comment a little bit on things that you're doing um, beyond, you know, just focusing on the social emotional. Um, areas. So I, I think it starts with you know, Dr. Williams from day one has talked about having each student having at least one adult advocate who knows the student, who cares for the student and, and supports the student. And, and that relationship, I think, is, is probably the foundation for that. When you have an understanding of who the student is beyond the classroom, if it's a teacher um, and, and if it's maybe a coach, beyond the field or court, you're going to move that student to excel in all areas of their life. And, and that I think is it's not a program. It, it's not a specific strategy, but those caring relationships serve as a foundation for addressing the needs of the whole child. You can't move a student you know, academically, personally, socially, emotionally, if you don't know and understand that individual. So I, I think that's really something that we're stressing, not only with our division as we go out and we support training uh, across programs in schools, but just really a, an approach and a philosophy that's incredibly important to us. Um, because if, if you don't know the individual, you're not gonna be able to help them. They're not gonna go to you in those times of need um, for support, for guidance. Um, and, and for somebody who, see something in themselves that they may not recognize on their own. Um, those, those positive traits that we can help build and bring to the surface and nurture um, throughout their lives. Amalio? And if I can add, thank you. Uh, uh, and thank you for the question, Dr. Hager. Um, this year, uh, the Division of School Climate and Safety um, inherited uh, the wellness policy um, and plan. And, and so we will be leading that efforts in collaboration um, with, um, with Karen um, Levenstein and in Food and Nutrition Services with Barbara Burnop, with, uh, with Dr. Renard Adams. Um, and so uh, our, our work has been a little bit delayed uh, because of all these other things that we are dealing with, but we've met as a group. We've looked at the, the policy, the revisions, and uh, what we're looking at is what will be the work of, of the group moving forward. And so we have representatives of all the areas you mentioned and the, uh, and the ones you didn't. 
uh, and really excited about using that group as a vehicle to do some substantive work um, around addressing the needs of the whole child. And the other piece is that we know that we we uh, we are committed to this work. Also, we've outlined um, in the strategic plan as focus area to to come up with a model for to for addressing the whole child, whole school, whole community. Wonderful. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was on mute, didn't realize it. Um, thank you for that. <clears throat> Were there any other questions from board members? Okay, great. Thank you so much for that um, in-depth presentation. Um, I think it, it, it shed a lot of information and gave us a lot of insight on, on, on what's going on. So um, next is our um, discussion of reopening cohorts. And uh, we call on Dr. McComas, Ms. Legman, and Dr. Uh, Logan Washington. Yes, so thank you so much. We are pleased to bring forward the next set of data related to our phases of school reopening. Uh, with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Logan Washington, who will walk us through just as she did last month for that first phase. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Next slide, please. So as we continue our discussion of the reopening cohorts and we will be discussing the final phases tonight, I want to bring us back to our critical questions um, for consideration as we are reviewing the data. So the first question is, what do you notice and wonder about the aggregate data? We'll talk about aggregate district-wide data as well as zone level data. What do you notice and wonder about the student group data? So I'll be going over race um, data, zone data, and specialized services data. And then also, what are the policy and budget implications or impact of this data? And then, as usual, I will talk um, and solicit questions and different perspectives around the data. Next slide, please. So the last meeting we discussed um, the reopening phase one and phase two. This meeting, we're going to talk about all of the um, remaining reopen phases, starting with our aggregate district wide data. So the blue percentage um, represents our in person, our students receiving in person hybrid learning and the red um, portion of the graph represents our students receiving virtual learning. District wide. So the graph to my far, I guess, left, um, if you're facing the same way I am, is our East Zone District, our East Zone, excuse me, Zone data district-wide for all remaining phases, with the red representing our virtual learning students, and with the blue representing our in-person students receiving in-person hybrid instruction. In the center, you will see our Central Zone, with the blue, again, representing students receiving in-person hybrid learning, and the red representing students that are receiving virtual learning in the central zone. And then to my far right is our west zone, with the blue representing students receiving in-person hybrid learning, and the red representing students receiving virtual learning. Next slide, please. So all reopen phases by race. So the first graph represents in-person hybrid learning by um, race district wide. And the graph to the right represents virtual learning. Next slide, please. And this graph actually was not included last month. Um, this is all reopening phases um, for specialized services district wide. So our students receiving free and reduced meals, our students receiving special education services, and our students receiving L services who are participating in in-person hybrid learning and virtual learning by specialized services.
Next slide, please. So this data represents our students in the East Zone in all reopening phases by race. So to my far left is in-person hybrid learning, and to my right is virtual learning in the East Zone by race. Next slide, please. These graphs represent the ESOM specialized services, excuse me, in all reopening phases. With our students receiving free and reduced meals being on the first graph, our students receiving special education services in the middle, and our students receiving L services to my far right. The purple represents our students receiving virtual learning, and the red represents our students receiving in person hybrid instruction. Next slide, please. These two graphs represent the students in the central zone by race for all reopening phases. So we have our in-person students receiving in-person hybrid learning by race in the central zone, and our students receiving virtual learning in the central zone by race. Okay, next slide, please. So these three graphs represent our students in the central zone receiving specialized services for all reopening phases. So the first graph is our students receiving free and reduced meal services. The middle graph represents our students receiving special education services. And the graph to the far right, my far right, is our students receiving L services. Again, the purple portions of the graph represent our students receiving virtual learning. And then the red portions are our students receiving in-person hybrid learning in the central zone for all reopening phases. Next slide, please. These two graphs represent our students in the west zone by race for all reopening phases. The first graph is our students receiving in-person hybrid learning by race in the West Zone. And the next graph is our percentages of students receiving virtual learning in the West Zone by race. Okay, next slide, please. So these three graphs represent our students in the West Zone who receive specialized services for all reopen, reopening phases. The first graph represents our students receiving free and reduced meals. The middle graph represents our students receiving special education services. And the graph to my far right is our students receiving L services in the West Zone for all reopening phases with the purple representing students receiving virtual learning and the red representing students receiving in-person hybrid learning. All right, next slide, please. So just as I um, began the presentation of data with the questions, I'll end with the same ones and I'll take any questions that you have and really want to talk out some of the questions that are here. Like, what do you notice and wonder about the aggregate data? What do you notice and wonder about the student group data? What are some of the policy and budget implications to this data? And then what additional perspectives do you have? Thank you so much for that, Dr. Little Washington. <clears throat> um, I mean, I can start off the questions, and again, anyone who has questions, uh, board members, please put your questions in the chat. Um, I noticed that the majority, it looks like if you're a minority student um, in our district, they're opting to remain virtual. And it didn't, from what I saw, and again, I looked at it and I just took down some notes briefly, it didn't matter if you were in the East, the West, or Central Zone. Um, overall for the central zone, it looked like it was almost 50%, 50% to remain virtual, 50%, 51 in person, 
to the west zone, it looked like 65% virtual and 50% in person. And then it looks like all specialized, like you said, farms, EL, um, want to remain virtual. So I guess my question is, is this is, you know, mirroring what I've seen nationally going on? And I wanted to know specifically as a system, what were we doing to support um, those populations and um, families who are opting to remain virtual and getting like sort of some data <clears throat> feedback and information specifically on why that is and I guess as a system, how can we help to support them? Thank you, Ms. Scott, that took your question down. I'm sure that was a lot, I apologize. <laughs> nope. Ms. Scott, do you want us to discuss or do you want us to collect the questions first or what's your preference on how you'd like to proceed? Uh, my question would be is, I don't know if you've already collected this and you already have an answer. If not, it would be great to collect that and, okay. um, uh, and, and, and then come back. I mean, I actually live in the West Zone and so um, there are things that I've heard and um, things like that. And so I, I guess I just wanted to know as a system, maybe should we be doing more in areas and for populations that may actually, you know, I know there's equal, but are we being equitable? There's more areas where we need to supply those families and kids with more support so they can feel comfortable coming back in. And as a board and even me as, as, as board chair and someone who has kids here, maybe there's more, um, things that you know can be done or more things that, that we can do so that um, we can assure our families and make them feel comfortable uh, coming back. Yes ma'am, okay thank you. Thank you. All right looks like we have a comment from Miss Lisa Matt. Um, my comment is somewhat a piggyback to what you just said Miss Scott although your comment talked about making students comfortable coming back but I too live in the West Zone and I see that we do have a high percentage of students who are virtual and should they choose to remain virtual when given the option of coming back four days a week, I think it's incumbent upon us to resolve the, um, the issues that we're having with bandwidth and things like that because there's a disproportionate impact of those issues in that students who are at home have spent count many hours over the last week or so, not even being able to access their teachers. Um, I've been given examples where parents actually stepped in because the teacher could not rejoin because he or she was in the classroom and actually taught the class, which I think is just wonderful. But if the students who currently are choosing to be um, virtual, stay virtual, we as a school system must do better with ensuring that they can connect with their lessons and connect with their classmates and connect with their teachers. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Agreed. Thank you for that, Ms. Mack. And it looks like we have Dr. Erin Hager next. Yes, um, thank you. I, I actually was digging a bit into the data from the last board meeting um, in addition to this data before uh, we met today. And um, and as far as reflections um, on the expanded data that you provided as well, um, you know, we, we see that the both African American and Asian students seem to be coming back in lower numbers um, proportionately if we're going with the 50 50 overall, you know, proportionate um, pie chart, um, but we are not seeing it in our Latinx communities. We're not seeing it in our communities with two or more races. And certainly we see the stark opposite with our white students. Um, and the thing that I think is the really critical then extension of this um, information that was shared was the um, disparities in attendance and achievement specifically among the African American students then that we see. And so I think we really need to bring this together and think about ways to, um, similar to what Ms. Mack was saying, to support the students if, if they do stay virtual, but if we do believe that in-person learning is you know, the gold standard and that that is what we need to do to really reach kids, especially if they're not doing well and not performing well, then um, I 
just truly believe we need more outreach in, in our communities and, and, to, and to do more, um, especially since we see it's, it's becoming more and more targeted to, to our African-American communities in all three zones. So, um, you know, just again, a comment, something to think about, but, um, but I think we do need to tie this with the academic data tightly and think about that. Thank you for that, Dr. Ian. Um, I, I would also just say as far as um, making sure, because I, I know there's some social kinds of things and as far as healthcare and resources that um, the school system is not equipped to, I mean, we're, you know, uh, it's not going to deal with, however, I think that it's imperative that, of course, coming back in class is the gold standard, but if they're choosing to remain virtual, um, even with all of the information that we've given, why are they choosing to remain virtual? Is there a larger issue as far as, um, you know, not just the health, not just COVID, but um, I've, I've seen, you know, maybe maybe other things going on. And so, and so I want to make sure that we are aware of that, that we are on top of that and that we are supporting these families, parents, of which I'm one, students making sure um, that, that we're addressing everything so that, so that they can come back. Yeah, and, and well, not only that they can, but that they're comfortable. So I would like for, um, I know it's not um, the end of our meeting yet, but to look at some ways that we can be more proactive and more supportive and so that there's a level of comfort um, so that we can welcome and ensure everyone that it's a safe and learning environment with which uh, um, um, to come back to. So I, I just wanted to make sure that we, we specialized and um, um, were on top of that. Did any other members have any questions or any comments? No? Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Logan Washington for that presentation. And, and next we have uh, Dr. Hager who will do a presentation on models of advisory councils. Um, yes, I, I sent some slides. Are they embedded in the... Um... Okay, you can go to the next slide. Hi. Um, so I'm giving this presentation with my University of Maryland hat, not my Board of Ed hat. <laughs> so um, I always have to specify which hat I'm wearing at any given time. Um, but some of you may know that I chair the State School Health Council, and I've done a lot of work over um, the past 10 years on uh, wellness teams and schools. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. These are slides that I have used uh, a bunch of times, so um, I'll kind of skim through some of them, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what things look like in Maryland. So next slide. So in Maryland, we have a state school health council that is mandated through Comar. I'll tell you a little bit about how long that's been in place. And then we have local school health councils in all 24 systems, including Baltimore County. And then we would like to see wellness teams in every school. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And I'll show you a little bit of data on that. Next slide. Next slide. Next, hit it again, sorry. Um, you can just keep clicking until the slide, the slide is through. Um, so we looked to see how long the State School Health Council was in place. We sent a law student to Annapolis who went into a basement of a library and dug up a, a paper that said that it was formally reorganized in 1966. So it's been around a really long time. Um, but the idea uh, was to kind of see what our history was. And you can see that, that the purpose of the state level council is to study, plan, and recommend action around health needs in schools. And so I know we don't have a state equity council, but I thought that you might wanna see kind of how this structure is, because maybe that's another thing that we could work to recommend as a county board of ed equity council. So again, thinking, thinking bigger picture, do we want to move upwards? Um, and this could be a potential model. So next slide. Um, so again, just kind of click through. I thought I sent you the PDF, so it would just go through without the, the little um, animations. But um, I was elected chair in 2018, and we did a lot of uh, updates to the State School Health Council. We do use the WISC model that was mentioned earlier, and I'll show you guys what that looks like. Um, it is a, a shared leadership with the State Department of Education and the State Department of Health, and then an outside member, which is me, um, and then we all share the, the overall leadership. Um, we have an executive board, which is composed of lots of different uh, health agencies and, and nonprofits around the state and around the country. And we did some listening tours to identify what exactly our members wanted um, to our council to focus on for the three-year term. So next slide. 
And so this is the WISC model that we keep talking about. I apologize that it's so small on the slide. I should have given you a big picture of it, but you can Google it. Um, it stands for whole school, whole child, whole community. Um, and it is developed by uh, the ASCD and the CDC. And the idea is there are these 10 components of school health and then at the, at the inside in the green are the five uh, tenets of a whole child. And so the idea is that we can work as a school to implement all of these 10 areas to promote health among children uh, while keeping them healthy, safe, safe, challenged, supported, and engaged. And so we do webinars that focus on all these areas. So it's not just about nutrition and physical activity, which is a lot of what I do. Um, if you're interested in learning more, I can share the information with you. Our next webinar is going to be on um, supporting wellness in a hybrid learning environment. So next slide. So again, if you're interested in learning more about this, which is the upwards uh, approach, uh, you can visit our website or you can email our, um, our, our secretary who can add you to our distribution list and you can be invited to webinars and all that fun stuff. So next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about local school health councils, which happen at the uh, county level. So, and again, these are required by law and you can just click through again. So they do exist in all 24 school systems um, and they must include health departments. And that's pretty much all that's required of a, of a local school health council. But I always say that no two are the same. So click again. They can vary by name, membership. Sometimes they're huge. Sometimes there's only about six people. Um, sometimes it's a subcommittee of another committee. Um, and some focus on the WISC model. Some only focus on nutrition and physical activity. Some really focus on um, providing guidance to schools, kind of a, a downwards model, and really helping the schools to implement the wellness policies or to, um, to work on school wellness initiatives. And if you click again, there are some models where they look up to the system and inform the Board of Ed and inform policy, and they don't really do a lot of work with the schools. And then if you click again, and some do both. Um, and I will say that some of the better models I've seen are ones that really engage the schools. I've seen models where a uh, principal from every level sits on the local school health council to report back to the to the to their principal groups. Um, I've seen ones where they visit as, as a larger group visit every single school during the school year to find out what's happening um, as a school health council. So there's so many cool things that the school health councils are doing that again, we may be able to learn a little bit from as our um, on this equity committee. So next slide. Oh, there should be a bunch more. No? I can share, if I can share my screen, I think I have them on there. They were yeah, all that's uploaded. Good. Yep. Oh, yeah. Mr. Horn, is it okay if I share my screen? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Give me two seconds for a transition. Yeah. Now I can keep talking if I can remember okay. what, I, um, what I had on there. Um, so I believe I was going to tell you some things that you can do. Um, all right, I have, I have them up here too. So um, another thing about local school health councils is that they're usually responsible for developing and informing the content of the wellness policy. So we heard a second ago that there's already a pro an approach in place to modify the wellness policy in Baltimore County. Um, we do a big study in my in my lab where we look at wellness policies across the state. Um, and in my slides, I can, I'll share a little bit about um, how well the wording, how good the wording is in these policies. So again, that's another thing we could do is think about the wording of our equity policy. Is it strong enough? Is it comprehensive? At what point will it need to be revised? And that certainly seems like a, a really important role of our committee moving forward. Um, another interesting thing is I told you that every school, every school system has a school health council. Um, but we asked schools, about a thousand schools, how if they if their school system had a school health council, and only 48% uh, um, knew that their their school system had a school health council. So we do need to uh, make sure that the, if we're going to if the goal is to work with schools, that then we um, then we make sure that the schools know we exist and that we can be helpful in uh, in, in pr promoting our ultimate goals of our committee. So then um, again, what can what can you do um, as far as a, a local school health council? Sorry, it's like two dueling computers here. Um, again, local school health councils, if you want to learn more, what we always recommend that others do is they um, maybe visit another local school health council. So again, that's something else we can consider doing as an equity committee. I'm sure there are other Board of Ed equity committees out there. Um, and so if we wanted to um, 
to go and visit uh, another another school board's equity committee, we could learn a little bit more about what they do. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's about it. Sorry, moving forward. I don't know what's happening with the slides. Um, okay, the last thing, which is the main thing I want to tell you about, were school-based wellness teams. Um, so there is really strong evidence that, as far as wellness is concerned, having a school-based wellness team to support wellness policy implementation can make a big difference. So a lot of the data and research that has come out of this has actually come from Maryland. Um, and I can share with you a CDC brief that was published that really highlights the importance of having school-based wellness teams. And um, they are recommended by the federal government and recommended by other agencies that work um, work with with wellness in, in, in schools. And so in Baltimore County, I know that's in our wellness policy and they are have been pushing really hard to have wellness teams in every school. Um, so again, we, we can talk more about that later. But the point is here is translating that into potentially having equity committees in schools. Um, right now across Maryland, we have about 62% of schools that have wellness teams because they are not required by um, by any sort of state or federal law. It has to be written into a wellness policy. So again, if we wanted to have some sort of a team at the school level, it's something we could potentially put into our equity policy potentially. So again, thinking about how to um, ensure that these types of uh, teams are, are in place. Um, another thing is the overwhelming majority of the people who lead wellness teams are uh, volunteers. And so that can, can present a challenge. And so if it's something that we really want to invest in um, for these equity committees, then we may want to consider looking at a way to potentially pay, um, pay the leader of the committee as uh, for their time. And then the last thing on my slides that again, I, I'll share again at some point, um, we have a uh, a split up of all the members that are on typically on wellness teams. And so something we can think about is who do we think needs to be on an equity committee at a school level, just so that you can make sure you have a diversity of representation of, um, of individuals within the school building on an equity committee. And so um, again, if you're interested in wellness teams, then look to see if your school has one and ask if you can join or consider helping to build one. Um, and we always, uh, our recommendation is always to advocate for pay for these individuals. And so the, the overall summary of the talk is just that, you know, there's this ent state level entity that is required by law. There's a local entity that is also required by law. The school level one is not um, in state or federal law, but it is in our wellness policy. And so we really um, hope that we can build these wellness teams at the school level. And so then I made a slide looking, just thinking back and reflecting on the lessons learned that could potentially get translated to um, to an equity team. I, my, from my own experience, I would recommend having a champion or a leader whose job it is to organize the committee. And that's not, not rocket science right there, but we need to have somebody in charge. Um, and that person should have a clear direction, potentially a job description, something that they know that they're supposed to be doing every year, Ideally, they would also have training, some sort of training where they would, you know, know what their expectations are and know what they need to achieve. Um, again, ideally, they would be, um, ideally, they would be uh, paid and not voluntold. I mean, ideally, you know, they, at least volunteering, ideally paid, um, they should not be told they have to lead this. This is something it should really, something they, they should be passionate about. Um, again, those teams really it would be best if they had a diversity of positions in the school. So not just classroom teachers, not just administrators, but people um, from all different uh, components of the school building so that you can really uh, distribute the messaging throughout the, the entire building. Um, and also one, one of our recommendations for wellness teams is that they have an annual report that they have to share. So maybe they report to us so in some way or, or some, some sort of way that's reported up about what they accomplished that year and what their goals were. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted as a discussion item is um, I learned recently that uh, there are a lot of recommended teams in buildings. <laughs> I was writing a, a paper actually with a, the Center for School-Based Mental Health and they said, oh, we think there should be mental health teams. And I said, well, we want to have wellness teams. And so now we're talking today about whether we want to have equity teams of some sort. And so just thinking about whether these multiple teams could somehow be merged or, you know, so, some a, a way that they're not just kind of, uh, you know, using the same resources and using the same individuals um, and everyone's bandwidth is really important. So that was all I had to say in my slides that I will eventually figure out a way to get to everybody. 
<laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, and yeah, any questions, um, please put in the comments. I guess I, I can just start off with a few. I think that's neat, like what you were saying as far as merging like a wellness and a um, equity team um, because the two would, would work together. Um, and then a wellness team, equity team in every school. Um, and then making a recommendation you said for, for like the state equity council and visiting and looking at what other equity committees are doing um, so that we can build on what we're doing. I think it's, it's also great uh, school health council. Um, something that caught my, my ear and I, I think is something that we could probably even look at doing more on this committee. And I'd like to hear your feedback on that, Dr. Hagers. Uh, you said the wording of our policies. You said our equity policy, but we have multiple policies and maybe that's something that we could do is reviewing various policies and looking at the equity language in those policies. So I love I, that. Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. Because I was, as you said it, I was thinking like they're probably equal, but are they equitable? And so just, you know, the committee and, and, and all of our background and, and, and everything and, and really kind of um, looking through uh, various ones and, and, and just looking at that language. Yeah, what do you think about that? I think that's a, a great thing. And, and for um, wellness policies, we have a lot of tools out there. Um, again, once they were mandated by the federal government, there are a lot of people researching them. Um, and so we um, we have, again, a tool that looks at the comprehensiveness of the language. So are, are all the components that are required in there? But then you also have to look at the strength of the language. And so is it you know, written to say, you might as well think about maybe doing that, or is it saying you must do this? And so um, there are lots of different kind of uh, policy evaluation tools that we could use. And it'd be great if we could even develop something that we could then use to for all of our policies, like you were saying. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Dr. Logan Washington or, um, or Dr. McComas, is that something that already exists at BCPS or is that something that we would have to look at and explore, and maybe bring to the full board and create or um, how would that work? like actually creating a tool or getting a tool or do we already have one? So we have a preliminary tool um, when evaluating policy, which is the equity lens questions that we go over um, and I try to insert them in every um, BOE equity committee um, meeting in terms of what are the what are the things that we're thinking about when we are planning for policy? What are we um, what unintended consequences? But I do um, really like the idea of you all thinking about something that is specific for um, Making sure that 0100 is embedded in the embedded in the development of policy every step of the way. Um, mm -hmm. I think those questions lend itself to a springboard for that, but really the ways that you all can think collectively together about the implications of 0100 for every policy um, in the BOE's um, rules. But I want to speak really quickly to the equity team. Each school, um, and we'll and Ms. Pastor asked the question to board meetings. Um, ago about equity teams and I do have some follow up information for you all. So each school um, does and and we not require but recommend that they have an equity team, but we'll give, get some more information on that as we proceed this evening. So we do have an embedded structure um, that is largely influenced by the ILTs, which are in every school. So that structure does exist. We're getting, um, as Ms. Pestor requested two meetings ago, some more information about the nuance of that infrastructure. And I did make a recommendation. I think we talked about it um, with you all's BOE Equity Council around making sure that that um, health was a component of that BOE Council. So the equity team sit, set, set, would sit separate and apart from your district wide um, equity council that we had been discussing. Dr. Boswell McComas, did I miss anything in that interpretation? No, ma'am, that's exactly what I was going to say. I knew that we had, um, I think the majority of schools were working to have equity committees. And um, I think you really covered it. I think I just want to compliment everyone because I think, you know, the more we um, look at this, the the more um, layers of support that I can see emerging out of this um, for not just our schools, but for our board members and and the ongoing work of budget and policy as well. So thank you. Thank you for that. And Dr. Logan um, Washington, I wanted to know because I have. Um, from it looks like the May Maryland Association of Boards of Education. They have looking through the equity plans and 
um, and I can actually probably share this with all members, but for any policy program practice decision or action, consider the following questions. It has five questions. Yep. And it asks you, is, is that what you all, what you were referring to? Um, yes, but it's not um, actually predicated from that particular um, that particular lens, but we use as a school district, we use five equity lens questions as a decision making model across the organization to ensure that we are looking at those things. And what I think um, I heard Dr. Hager say, it would be a unique and innovative idea to intersect um, 0, 100, um, mm -hmm. 0 100 with those questions to ensure that when you all are developing policy, 0 100 is a paramount feature in that particular decision making models. So what would it look like? to um, marry those questions that MAVE has, the questions that we um, use district-wide, and the promises of, of policy 0100 to create your own decision-making model as you all move forward as a collective board of education around our commitment to equity. Okay, and I think also, as, as Dr. Hager said, even looking at our, our, I would like for this committee also to look at our policies and, and do some um, intersectionality of, of our, our, the ones that are already existing are we looking at them in an equitable way and the language and, and, and those kinds of things also? So I, th yeah. I think it's something that we'll probably um, um, take on if, if everyone is agreeing going forward. I, I think that would be very beneficial. Right, if I may, Ms. Uh, Scott, also add that could be as simple um, and as quick to um, support by creating um, those in a laminate card that is at each of the board member places for all of your um, Work I have rather. laminated cards. I have about 12, so I think <laughs> <laughs> the, teacher, the teacher and me cannot resist uh, laminating resources. So, uh, but it could be at each of your places so that you use them during any committee meeting or the full board process as well. So, um, thank you. Thank you for that for reminding me. I'll make sure. I'll make sure we follow up on that. <laughs> thank you. Ms. Pestifer, did you have a question or comment? I do. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Logan Washington, for looking at that. I put a comment in the chat that um, we all have to do better, both from, and from your office and as board members and administrators, in making sure that all staff members know that such a team exists in the school. And anytime anyone is unaware of it, that means it's not being um, used as I'm sure you have you, your office has trained them and expect them um, to be using them because as I put in the chat it's critical to um, equity is critical in how every teacher every day is working with the students because all of our children learn differently and at different weight uh, rates and that's that equity issue to which you're trying to get our staff members. Um, but I'd like to go back, Dr. Zarchin. I can't remember whether it was Dr. Zarchin or Dr. Nieves who spoke about um, restorative practices. Um, Ms. Scott, as we're talking about policies, uh, and I, I'm sure Dr. Logan Washington has looked at this, um, our restorative practices need to be reviewed. Um, we used to have fewer, now we have quite a number, um, but we must remember and make sure, um, Ms. Scott, if we can look at them again, um, that those restorative practices really are restorative and not just laying a path for um, continued problems with behavior. So we need to look at them again. I'd like for them that policy to be right at the top of what we're doing because I think we're doing our students a disservice when people are using some of those practices. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I just wanted to just clarify. So you're saying that you would like us when we look at our policies to look at our policy for restorative practices and how it's implemented and like that. OK. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did any staff have any questions, comments or, or follow up questions for that? I, I do, Ms. Pesher, and this may not, um, Ms. Scott, this may be something for an, another time, but I just, um, I will say as someone who um, turned my school around completely and we reduced violence in our school by 93% within two years, 
uh, uh, with fidelity of implementation of restorative practices. I'm just wondering as we dive deeper into that, um, that we look at how things are being implemented because what I have I have experience and I know firsthand as a leader of restorative practices, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions around restorative practices. There's a lot of yes. um, what I would say half-hearted um, implementation, and I'm not saying in any particular school, but just as a leader who has helped, who has led faculty in embracing restorative practices, uh, there's a lot to doing that well, and I just a offer uh, that we consider that as we dive deeper and examine that because I have seen the power, the transformative power uh, for young people and for faculty and for an entire school community, um, but I also recognize how very easily it can be done poorly um, and then people, um, you know, buy out. And so I just offer that as um, something to consider. So thank and you. And I, I want to thank you for sure. saying that um, because the two of my schools, we used restorative mm -hmm. practice as well. But um, when people in your system look at some of the practices we have as part of policies and they laugh and they mm -hmm. are dismayed, then we certainly do need to go back. And when students start looking at them, and thinking that they're humorous and start acting out because they know in their particular schools that certain practices are being followed. They go further than we, we would want oh, them. And so yeah, I agree yeah. wholeheartedly. Thank you for saying that, Dr. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Just I wanted to add an area that I think will help with the restorative practices is our positive behavior planning guide, which has been greatly revised um, since last year. It was uh, developed, uh, reviewed, and revised um, with uh, representatives from TABCO case. Um, it was really a, a, a team effort to, to, to look at how we address behavior in schools and how it can be a support uh, instead of just a consequence. So I, I think that whole approach will help as well moving forward. And if I can add, Ms. Pastor, I think that's a great uh, question and comment. Um, uh, through the system improvement team on suspensions, uh, that work group has been examining some of our practices and, um, and looking at the data to identify where we've seen uh, uh, in great results in terms of reducing disproportionality and um, we've identified a couple of schools where restorative practices have been happening. And so we're hoping to take that information um, to, and to share that with other school leaders as they're working to uh, reduce uh, this proportionality um, uh, in suspensions. Outstanding. And I think it's critical when we think about um, the use of the equity lens that that question about are there any unintended consequences for the implementation. So if we keep that implementation of the policy, if we keep that on the table, it will help us mitigate and really understand the ways that policies can underserve children also and being, you know, just having the conversation and bringing it to the forefront, I think is essential and a review of that policy would be great. I think that's important, yeah, how that policy could, um, or, or other policies as we review it, could have unintended consequences that could be inequitable, but that we perhaps were not, um, were not privy to when the policy was actually created. So um, I know it's, again, I keep saying that it's not a, the time to set the agenda for further business, but um, I think that's something that will probably be ongoing because we have a lot of policies. So um, I, I would love for this committee to, to review a lot of those. Okay. Any additional questions or comments? Okay, great. And our last presentation is on um, district-wide equity analysis metrics and discussion of results of equity, the equity team survey. And for that, we call on Dr. McComas, Ms. Lakeman, Dr. Logan Washington, Dr. Wheatley Phillips, Dr. Deganis, and Dr. Minus. Thank you. 
So thank you everybody. Um, in response to a um, district-wide equity analysis submitted by Ms. Mack, um, I partnered with the Office of um, Data Research and Assessment, DRAA, um, to really give Ms. Mack's um, request some some light as well as um, to give some perspective to it. So I invited the entire data team that um, partners with me every meeting to ensure um, that we have the, the data request actually met. So I want to invite them into the space to actually lead this discussion and walk through some of the things um, per your request, Ms. Mack. So I'm going to, I guess, introduce Dr. Wheatley Phillip, who will then introduce her team. So thank you so much and good afternoon to everyone. It's been a great conversation, not only in terms of what the data show, but ways in which we can be healthy and well and ways within which we can take care of our students in terms of restorative practices. So this sums up and brings us to a nice place in which we can talk about the data specifically as it relates to the disproportionality that exists and it continues to persist in BCPS. Joining me today have members of our team. We have Dr. Eric Minus. So I'll ask him to turn on his um, camera so that you can see him. Dr. Asha Degans, woohoo, today was gonna work to get her um, um, vaccination. So she, I don't know if she's with us, but we cheer her on and we'll support her um, as she's with us vicariously if she's not in the meeting. We also have Dr. Maria Finger Elam, who is our coordinator for data strategy. And together we all are here to support Dr. Logan Washington as she presents the information. So thank you so much for inviting us and having us to join you today and we'll help in any way we can to really help make the data be real and authentic and lead towards policy decisions that will help support our students and our staff. So thank you so much. Next slide please. Good afternoon. Hi, um, I was able to go early to get my second vaccination. So that's done. So I am here. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank congratulations. you. Congratulations. <laughs> so good to see you. Yes, thank you. So I want to say thank you to everyone for inviting us. We are now the Office of Data Analytics, formerly the Data Warehouse. So we go by TOTA, um, which is short for the Office of Data Analytics. And I just wanted to point out that this equity metrics report was released in November. There was a press release that went out on the bcps.org website, but it was November 20th when it went out. There was a press release that had a link to this report. And as you know, um, I think four days later is when we suffered the ransomware attack. So the link, of course, is broken, but we are we were able to get it back up on our DRAA key report site. So it is there for the public. And also we were able to look at the requested metrics and identify where many of these uh, measures or metrics can be found publicly. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Maria Singer Elam to talk about where we can find these um, different data points. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Dr. Maria Finger Elam and um, we, uh, as um, Dr. Dagans mentioned, we went through um, the request uh, measure by measure, point by point to locate some um, uh, either reports, static reports, or dashboards that are dynamic uh, that are publicly available where these data can be found. Um, so I'll start with the measures within the learning accountability and results um, compass uh, uh, section. For the KRA, for average kindergarten readiness, um, uh, looking at where students fall in the performance levels for KRA, uh, DRAA actually produced a KRA data summary um, based on the 2019-2020 uh, um, administration of the KRA, which is available the same location as the equity metrics report on the uh, DRAA key reports page. Um, in addition, looking at the percentage of students taking AP courses, um, our Office of Performance Management within DRAA produced a AP trends by student group uh, report that looked at the trends in AP participation and performance on exams. Um, across a four-year span. Uh, again, this is available on the DRAA key reports page. So that's um, three reports thus far that are available on that particular page. I think there are about a dozen overall reports um, available on that page, and these are publicly available reports produced by our division. 
Um, in terms of looking at the number of special education staff, now I'm going to talk about um, some of the metrics that are listed within learning accountability results, um, safe and supportive environment, and then also the high performing workforce, pardon me, because MSDE produces a really comprehensive data download that lists um, staff members across um, system. It lists the number um, by role, so that data are available there. Those data are available there, pardon me. In addition, MSDE produces annually a static school and central office staff report that looks at these data by position, role, um, years of service, and then also demographics, gender and race ethnicity. Um, so again, that will um, get at the school counselors, social workers, psychologists, nurses, principals and APs, in addition, um, the teachers. So all of these data are available um, publicly via um, MSDE. Additionally, when talking about the classroom teachers, on our um, BCPS public school profile dashboard, there are data around the number of classroom teachers, student to teacher ratio, average class size, and that's available by school on the school profile dashboard, um, which you can also find if you go to the DRAA page um, listed under our data dashboards. In addition, I'm um, finally looking at operational ex excellence, that compass measure. Um, when looking at the operational budget, operating budget, pardon me, these data are listed on the school profile dashboard that I just referenced, as well as within the um, about 500 page, the, the really comprehensive adopted operating budget. This, these are listed by school. Um, in addition to looking at the facilities assessment, the building utilization uh, data are listed on the school profile dashboard. In addition, there's the educational facilities master plan, the students count report, which all include these data as well, looking at uh, funding uh, per, per pupil expenditures. Finally, um, these data are also available from MSDE. They produce an annual report that looks at per pupil expenditures um, by school. Um, and in most cases, the data I've referenced related to MSDE, we can go back nearly 20 years. Um, and these data are provided on the school level. Oh, thank you. Next slide, I'm sorry. The, um, the equity metrics report that Dr. Dagans mentioned that we published um, November 20th includes um, system-wide measures um, by, based on by student group for some of the following um, outcomes. MAP performance, MCAP performance, looking at college career readiness for our um, high school students as well as um, graduation rates. Um, we look at access to AP coursework. All of these data are provided by student group to look at um, inequities and inequitable outcomes. Um, in terms of the percentage of students achieving certain benchmarks in the metrics. In addition, we look at climate measures. We include um, data related to climate measures such as chronic absenteeism and uh, suspensions. We uh, also include in this report, this is a, a rather a, a comprehensive report. It's about 25 pages. Um, we look at within special education differences um, by race ethnicity on these same outcomes. So we look at them system wide overall and then within the subset of our students who are eligible for special education services. We also include data on school-based staff demographics. Um, we look at that at the uh, school type and then also by position, so teacher, AP, and principal. In this report, we also include some of the information I just referenced, um, links to publicly available data, um, looking at enrollment, demographics, uh, a myriad of outcomes, climate, uh, staff data and then also budgeting. Within this report, not only do we look at BCPS data, but we also compare um, our outcomes in terms of equity um, on these measures to some of our similar um, LEAs within the state. I believe we compared to Baltimore City, Montgomery County, and Prince George's County. And finally, there is a section of the report um, I think that will be discussed a bit more in which um, CNI addresses some of the disproportionality and discipline. And um, I guess I can hand it over if someone wants to uh, speak to that portion a bit. Thank you. Good afternoon again. So I, I'd actually like to defer to be able to have a, a more a time on that. Um, so I think if there's more we want to go on and talk about.
so I wanted to make sure is their presentation ended or is there more um, that you needed to present to us? So this presentation was just an overview of the, the report and the data that was available per Ms. Max request. Um, on the publicly held website under DRAA key reports is the full report. This report was released, as Dr. DeGain said, on November 20th, but it's, you know, quickly disappeared based on um, the catastrophic ransomware attack that we had. So I wanted to make sure that I provided Ms. Mack some information and I see she has a question. She provided Ms. Mack, Ms. Mack some information where to find all of the different metrics that, um, all of the different me metrics she requested, but also um, the research office has provided, the data research and analytics office has provided kind of a, uh, cheat sheet or guide w to where she can find some of the more discrete um, okay. metrics that she requested and that yep. um, will be sent to you all after this particular board meeting. And but, if I could ask, if I could uh -huh. interject. Absolutely. Um, sorry. Um, was this built off of the equity audit that was originally done? Yes, yes, this is actually the title of the report is a response um, to the, uh, the the report we uh, initially, I think, um, contributed to at the October Board of Education um, yeah. meeting. Yeah, there were some um, some additional pieces, and one of them was to compare to like school systems and to add in within group comparisons among special our students eligible for special education services. So it's, this is in, in response to that. Yes. All right, Ms. Matt, can go ahead with your question. Thank you, and I, I apologize if I don't call anybody by name because I'm not sure who was speaking when. Um, I appreciate knowing where the data is, but the reason I asked for the data to be provided in a comprehensive spreadsheet of all schools measuring the same data is so that we as an equity committee can make sure that we are allocating resources, both human and capital, and even operating budget resources, correctly to address the needs of our students so we can give them what they need. I pull a lot of data myself, but I don't have time to pull the level of data that is needed to provide that type of analysis. And it wouldn't matter if I looked at it by myself because we are a team who needs to address the needs of all of our students. So my question is, is there a team or a person or a group within BCPS that can take all of the data? Uh, because it sounds like everything that I've asked for is available somewhere and just put it in a report so that we, the members of this equity committee, and we, the members of the board, know what to advocate for as we move forward. I'm sorry, good afternoon, Ms. Mack. Thank you so much for the question, and I think I'll begin to answer, and certainly we can have um, Dr. McComas sharing in terms of we can share what the data show and then how it would be utilized would be part of that instructional and that curriculum piece. Um, in answer to your question, we don't have a team that can pull all of these data together. And I say that because I understand your question comes from the heart and the right place because we want to be able to have those conversations regarding why our students are not performing and why the gaps exist and persist. But to be quite honest with the board, right now we are in a rebuild status in DRA. We were struck down, knees capped um, in terms of the ransomware attack. We at this time are working to rebuild our environment. We have 175 schools that right now with students coming back are making requests for us of very specific data because they want to know with the year that students have not been in buildings, what exactly are the gaps that exist and what are some of the ways within which they can receive those data to help make those decisions. We are moving into the school progress planning season and at this time, the number of requests that we have from schools specific to what's available so that they can be good consumers of the data and they are able to access those dashboards to be able to have those conversations at the school level. We are working just to build our infrastructure so we can provide that type of service. So I think the team's goal in terms of showing where the data were was that if the equity committee in identifying a specific policy has a particular question, there are places in which the data is sitting, but to have hundreds of spreadsheet or data to put into hundreds of spreadsheets we don't have that's not efficient for us and we really don't have the personnel to do that at this time just because of the ransomware and because of all the other requests that are coming in from 175 schools and their staffs 
asking us for data around the students that are sitting in seats right now. We need to know what they have learned, what gaps exist, and how schools can specifically develop individual plans to help support those schools. So I appreciate that, Dr. Wheatley, Philip, very much, but I would like to point out that I made this request last June, four or five months, or maybe seven months before the ransomware attack. And I would want you to use your resources to support schools because I need students to be supported. But I don't think it's an unrealistic request at some point in time. At what point in time could this data be provided in a format that we could look at and say, oh, well, that's why this school is struggling in reading. Every other school has this and this school doesn't. And I interject here. I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, Dr. Wheatley Phillips, because I, I wanted to uh, just interject because I, I understand what, what you're saying and, and, and Dr. Wheatley Phillips is, is, is speaking up in regards to the data, but we did receive a compass and we did receive an outline of where there were gaps back in July of 2020. It's the equity metrics data that um, Dr. Wheatley Phillips was a part of that was pulled together when um, Dr. Lisa Williams was here. That is why we did that at the very beginning. Now, if there was some uh, misunderstanding of what was in that audit or 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 it's evaluate or needs to be reevaluated or um, or re looked at. Then we can do that. But that was our guiding compass in going forward. That is currently up on the website now because I just pulled it up because I know it did come down because of the ransomware. But it's under Board of Education, and then it says Equity Metrics Data July 2020. And in there, because it's not just saying, well, this school has this, that school has that, and that's why the school is failing. No, it showed system-wide systemic student outcome trend data disaggregated by student groups. It showed teachers, it, it showed all of these things. So that is our, our, our guiding compass and it gets to um, Lisa, uh, excuse me, um, Ms. Matt, some of the things that, that, that you were speaking about. No, I and, agree, but not at a school level. And that's, the, issue that's the, not at a, the issue is not at a school level though. It's not that this school is doing well because this other school has this and this other school has that. It's a systemic issue and it's populations of students that VCPS may be failing or could improve upon based on systemic issues. It's not based on school issues. That's but how it I could be based on allocation system. issues, the allocation of resources and it how schools get them are important. And it would be systemic allocation of resources because what may be equally distributed, like say PPE equipment may not be equitably distributed. And that's a systemic issue. It's not that you just apply it to, well, this school or, or, or that school. So we have to make sure that we're asking the right questions. Well, I, I think it is the right question. I, I would just like to know if we are ever going to be able to get data at a school level so that we as a team can make sure that resources, again, human and financial resources, are allocate, allocated equitably to our students. Well, that's where we agree to disagree because it's systemic. It doesn't happen at this school or that school. It's BCPS as a system that supplies those resources to all schools. And then what we need to probably look at, and Dr. Whitley Phillips, maybe that's something that we could do, is how are our resources being supplied to all of our schools? Um, and, and then again, what are those resources that, that we're wanting to look at? And then we can look at and see which are different. But we need to make sure we're asking the right questions to get the right answers. And looking at things from a holistic perspective, not singularly, where we don't see the forest for the trees, but we're only looking at like one tree. Oh, I'm sorry. Other people have comments and questions. I apologize. Uh, Ms. Mack, did you have more questions? No? no? Okay. Uh, who was next? Uh, Ms. Pastor. Thank you. Um, I'm looking forward, Dr. Um, Wheatley Phillip, to uh, and Dr. McComas, to when we're able to actually get back in. And I know I referred to it at the last board meeting, so I'm gonna say it again. And I hope I have the right page. Um, and that's page ten of the compass about the. Um, instructional core team so that I know that um, we are looking at schools 
that have not been doing well and that plans have been laid out for them so that they will make improvements. And if I recall correctly, once the administration in those schools um, feel that they can carry the weight, if you will, then they can come, they get to move on and they will create their own school teams. So I think that just certainly addresses um, consideration of where our numbers have been and it is now a part of an action plan to change that around. Am, am I on the right page with that? Well, I, I am happy to share a little bit more about our instructional core team process. So you're um, right, Ms. Pesture, in that our instructional core team process, or ICT, we often uh, shorthand it as, um, is a process that our community superintendent um, facilitate. And so um, what it's intended to do is to orchestrate and coordinate all the resources from all the different divisions. So for example, for my division, it's often deploying our resource teachers, our coordinators, our directors to provide direct in-school support through coaching, um, whether that's in the classroom, whether that's with a team of teachers or um, with assistant principals or principals. And and I would say if I, I know Dr. Zarshan's with this, members of his team also deploy to schools uh, to provide that support. And so our community superintendent, our division of school support and achievement um, are really the ones who orchestrate all of that and we step in to be part of that orchestra and they um, monitor um, how things are progressing and they help identify what schools uh, we're going to serve and support and then uh, we collaborate on what is um, what is the actual need of the school and then what's the best method of beginning to address that um, and we do it in a way so that as not to overwhelm a school, right? Like if we have a school that needs social emotional support and they need academic support um, and maybe they need data coaching support as well, um, that we don't want to just everyone show up at the same time and overwhelm the school, but we, we develop a thoughtful process of who, when, and how uh, we're providing that direct support. And you're right, Ms. Pesture, the intention is um, for example, in our residency model that we use in academics, when we send uh, teams to a school, the, the, the resource teachers um, are in residency with that school for a three week cycle. Um, and, and part of that process is to ensure that the school identifies um, a teacher leader or a school leader who will then help kind of carry the torch to ensure that um, the adjustments and supports that we are making in real time um, become sustaining uh, uh, behaviors and uh, sustaining um, processes at the school. So I hope that that helped uh, a little bit. And you're right, that's a that directly helps with our compass. Um, you know, our goals within our compass. So, but that's well, I hope so. Thank you, because you know the words I hate now are weight. And it takes I know time. I cannot say to you it will okay. take time. I, yes, ma'am. No. I know not to say that. No, please, um, because the numbers keep repeating themselves year after year after year after year. So I'm hopeful just from what I read and what you've said that you go in with and I think Miss Scott has used this word or someone has used it that we'll tell maybe all of you are using it that holistic view and what you described is holistic, but that we're also working with those or you're working with those administrators so that when they say we have this, you have a team and that what we're going to start seeing, because I just said it in curriculum, um, our, our board goals do speak to things that are measurable and they are time um, sensitive because we'll be looking at them as they come up and that we'll be able to see um, um, those successes um, by what is happening with that and with other things. So I'm looking forward to it timely. Yes, yes ma'am. If I, if I may just, oh Miss Scott, I don't want to cut you off. Go ahead Miss Scott. Oh no, I was just going to thank Miss Pastor. Um, but go ahead, um, you had a response, Dr. McComas. Uh, yes, ma'am. I just wanted to share uh, just one quick example uh, just to help um, 
help everyone have an understanding. Um, in particular, I can think of we have a, a group of elementary schools uh, that the community soup and the executive directors identified. Um, we were able to send our elementary math coordinator to work directly with the principals in an ongoing uh, process over time, as well as our residency teachers went in to do uh, classroom coaching and classroom uh, instructional modeling. And it was all really focused around ensuring uh, uh, bridges were being the bridges curriculum was being implemented with fidelity and so in that process we were able to support the teacher right to, to make sure that the the teacher has a model of how this program is implemented with fidelity what does that look like what does that feel like in real time with children in the classroom day in and day out and we're also able to support the principals and understanding what is it uh, that they need to be looking for that they you know miss pasture i know you always come back to that um, implementation, accountability of implementation, right? And so through the ICT process, I can think of like one particular example popped into my mind where we were really able to layer and orchestrate that to ensure that we we're doing exactly what you often ask. And those are the, the orchestrated um, efforts that need to be made very intentionally to be able to move our data because it is urgent. It's way past time. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott, for the opportunity to just share that example. And Ms. Scott, if I could just add up around Dr. Williams' work with the systems improvement team, um, he has organized 11 interdisciplinary teams in which they're spending a year of study. They're looking at data, they're visiting schools, they're conducting interviews, and they are working real deeply in terms of working with school staff and central office staff to look at the needs of our schools and to bring forth recommendations by the end of the year to Dr. Williams that he in turn will share with the board because this report that they're developing will be shared with the board in terms of what are some of the critical needs that our schools have and what are some of the recommendations that are realistic that can be brought forth for him to consider and also to share with the board. So that is also a process that we have in place in addition to the instructional core team, in addition to the school progress planning process, we also have the systems improvement teams that are meeting and working and looking at data and will bring forth recommendations in terms of ways within which we can improve the learning experiences of our students. So thank you. Yeah, thank you all for that information. It looks like it's a, a lot that we're doing. Um, we're supporting our students, and this is just, I think, ways that we can drill down and, um, and, and be even more supportive. So I, I, I appreciate that. Um, so I know that we are coming to the end. I believe we have lost Dr. Hager. Um, I don't know if she's still on, but um, I wanted to make sure that we were able to um, wrap up and if there was any further business that any board members wanted to add for the next um, uh, meeting, uh, one of the things I, I wanted to look at was the, the looking at our starting to review some of our policies. So maybe um, you all could perhaps pull some policies for us that we could look at and review how if we're using you know an equity lens as as we um, look at those first starting with our policy 0100. Maybe that's what we need to start with first. And something else that I wanted to um, look at as well was actually starting our um, the equity advisory group. Dr. Hager spoke about having equity wellness, I guess, advisory groups at schools, identifying those, and then starting using that to build and start a larger one that we can work from. It would be great to, um, to hear about that and to start with that. Did any other members have any questions or suggestions for, for our next meeting? Um, so if there's um, no further business, then I would say that the meeting is adjourned. So I, I, I appreciate everyone coming and thank you all for your time. So and I hope everybody has a great evening. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Dr. McComas, thank you. Thank